The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. Box score from Nevix at the Old Garden. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. We have a full panel to talk to Hal Bach and ask him, what's the score, Hal? Well, the score this week is the start of the uh, postseason for college basketball. I wrote this column about uh, Sean Miller, with whom uh, Alan Blunkin is familiar because he played at uh, Pitt and uh, now coaches at Arizona. And uh, he'll be on the sidelines as the postseason begins, even though uh, he was uh, mentioned in a probe by the FBI. They have wiretaps out and... uh, one of the wiretaps has him talking about a hundred thousand dollar payoff to a top recruit, which uh, is uh, not exactly the uh, the right way to operate in college basketball. But I think a lot of schools are doing that. So uh, he uh, sat out a game against Oregon. They lost, and then the university invited him to come right back because we got games to win and maybe championships to win and money to earn for the university. So that's what I wrote about this week. I wrote about going up. Yeah, Hal, I read a column you did on Anthony Rizzo and the Parkland. Was that that yours? Oh, about, yes, it was. Yeah, because that's the last one I found on the website. Yeah, I wrote that a couple of weeks ago about uh, Rizzo visiting uh, his old school. uh, Yeah. You know, that horrible tragedy that 17 people got killed. And I thought it was quite a thing for uh, for Rizzo to uh, to feel so moved to leave the Cubs training camp and and uh, return to uh, to South Florida to the school where he went to, went to high school and played his high school ball. Um, it's a horrible story. I mean, it's just I uh, spent a lot of days thinking about those kids and those educators who died needlessly, foolishly for no reason. Uh, because some guy got a hold of an AK-15, you know. Well, we've had a couple of copycat incidents here in the D.C. area just this last day or so. Uh, fortunately, the cops intervened before anything could happen, but they caught a couple of kids with, uh, they caught their, their writings about how they were going in. Uh, these kids put this stuff on the on the Internet. And, and, you know, and there was a couple up here really also. Cool. And there's one in New Jersey, and there was People another one in the... to them and turning yeah. them in now. Where yeah. Where in the yeah. past, you'd get these writings, and, oh, we knew that kid was a little nuts, but little, we didn't yeah. say anything, and, um, well, now, Well, you know, they got they went to one kid's house. The cops went to one kid's house. He wasn't home at the time. His mother was there. They found an arsenal of weapons in his house. Well, you know what? That, that's what that's what's hard to imagine what goes on there because just like this this Parkland shooting, I mean, so there was supposedly so many you know uh, warning signs and 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 things that that should have been happened that never happened, and and all of a sudden you know the kid walks in there and and and, and shoots up the school. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, and then they catch him afterwards, but you know that's after the fact. Yeah, there, there was a case up in the. Uh, New York, uh, the Rockland County, where they uh, caught uh, they caught it. They shut down the school. Uh, it was either Rockland County or Northern New Jersey, where they shut. They caught the kid. The kid had posted that uh, he thought that uh, the Florida thing was terrific, and they caught the kid. Uh, they shut. You know, they caught him in time. They shut everything down. They caught the kid. Right. Well, maybe this, awareness is solu- what it's to me, about. And, uh, there's a simple solution to this problem. And that is, school starts, you lock the doors. Nobody's allowed in. You also have security guards in the school. And, you know, then let them try to shoot it up then, you know. I I don't think they'll succeed. But if you have the doors open and kids can, uh, people, whoever, not kids, but uh, malcontents or whoever, can just walk in the front door, I mean, that's just an invitation, you know. Well, I don't think they all can. Who is it? One of them actually shot up up open a window to get into the school, if you recall. That might have been Parkland. He he used he used his weapon to blow out the window, and and that's how he got in. Um, As far as I can remember, 
Um, these things happen so frequently, sadly, that you, you don't Well, they, know they do, and you know what? Uh, I live right across the street from where I went to high school, and then there's two middle schools where my kids all went. And, and you know, the security, uh, there is no security. I mean, what the, you know, maybe there will be eventually, but right now there's a sign on the door, and the sign says, you know, unauthorized personnel not allowed in. If you have an appointment oh, or whatever, you know, just go in and see the principal right or whatever. And turn around and go home, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's yeah. just it's just scary that that you know. I think most schools, kids, parents, whatever, say, well, it can't happen here, but God Almighty, it can happen anywhere, and it has been happening. Anywhere. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that, the what quick I was to post. encouraged by was the reaction of those kids. Yeah. Uh, oh, they I mean, did. They, they really did a wonderful was, job. Absolutely, Hal. They I agree stood with up you. and and uh, they made it known that they were not going to sit still. And and a, this this is the hope uh, for this country that this next generation of kids who will be voting in the next couple of years will straighten it out, you know, and and get the right legislators in there and get gun laws changed and and uh, maybe we have hope in this country from that generation. Yeah. Well, if you look at Florida, I mean, Florida, the legislature there is already considering bills to make it more difficult. And that's a new, Florida is like the gun capital you know, outside of Texas. Florida is the gun capital of the world. And um, they, they're passing legislation to raise the age to 21. And uh, there were a couple of other, uh, they haven't gone as far as to ban uh, AR-15s. Uh, but there was, there's a couple of other restrictions that they, the fact that they're even considering this in the state in the state right. legislature down there is an amazing turning point, and there will be some legislation uh, that uh, the governor will sign into law. He's already said so. Now you, 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 you put that. By these kids protesting. Yes, absolutely. We, and they, as we all know, are our future. So. That's very encouraging. Yeah, I, I was really uh, touched by uh, uh, Rizzo's reaction to that. Uh, the closest thing I remember is last year when uh, Todd Frazier hit a foul ball at Yankee Stadium that hit a little girl. Yes. He was he was broken up by that, and he, he wound up befriending the uh, the family of the uh, little girl. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he went to the hospital, well. I recall. Yeah. Well, Frazier's a very decent guy. I've talked to him, and, and he's a very passionate kind of a guy, and, and I can understand why he would do that. Uh, I know that there are some players who wouldn't, so take my word for it. I've been in clubhouses. Yeah, but, right. But uh, not Todd Frazier. <laughs> yeah, well, they are extending the netting uh, at Yankee Stadium this season. Yeah, they're doing it at all the ballparks. Yeah. They, they should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. I, I've I've been to ball games and I've sat there and I mean I've been around so many ball games. I said, you know, this this is suicide here. I mean, a line drive coming off a bat, you have no defense, and it's a wonder that that people haven't been killed. Well, I tell you, I was sitting in one of those luxury boxes at um, in Cleveland uh, with some buddies about I guess, about two years ago now, and uh, foul. Now this is up in the mezzanine kind of level, and the windows were open. It was just out looking out onto the field, and people in the next place they weren't even paying attention to the game you could tell because you could hear all the noise and a foul ball came up and it hit one of the women in the next she wasn't even paying attention to the game and they had to take her to the hospital right and that was pretty far away from the oh yeah that that would be yeah but if if you're sitting uh, you know where there were no screens or netting uh, until now i mean you were really in danger because oh yeah on their own the field you know, I I sat with uh, you know watching with some friends and you know left-handers coming up and I said and then we were sitting on the third base side. I said, be ready. I said if one comes this way, you know it's going to come so fast you can't even react. Yes, yeah. I'll tell you a little story about that. I was covering a game at Shea Stadium, and when you're working for the Associated Press, you're writing at almost all the time. Your your head is down. Right. It was the ninth inning, and I was riding my lead, and I foolishly had my head down. Joe Morgan was the hitter, and he hit a foul ball that came whistling into the press box and grazed my cheek while I had my head down. Whoa. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, it didn't hit me in the eye, but uh, it came right. very close. 
So it's, that was my adventure. Well, that's a scary story, Hal. That, I could see absolutely see where that could happen. No, no question about it. There's a I mean, mind. What, you're, what you're saying, a lot of people, a lot of fans. I mean, I've even seen pictures where you know guys are getting foul balls. They're, they're they have a little child in their arms. They're, they're dropping. Yes, isn't that insane? Like, insane? What are the people thinking about for crying out? And they, the and baseball. They you know, yeah, they bring this baseball. Five and a half dollars, you know. Well, not only that, it's the sort of bringing these infants to the infants to the ball game, right. strapping them to your chest, right. you know, right. which is what they do. Just, and just unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Yep. But you yeah, know, I can only, recall the got killed several years ago by a, a line drive foul ball during a game. Who? The minor league coach. His last name was Coolboy. Oh, I I remember that. Yeah, it was several years ago. I do remember that. I also remember the story of a guy and got hit by a foul ball, was being carried off out of the stands, and as he's being carried off, he gets hit by another foul ball. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that was. I think. Well, I don't know whether it was that instance, but I, I know they talked about Richie Ashburn doing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, not obviously not intentionally, but the fact is that. That his reputation was, you know, he, he fouled off a lot of pitches. I think it was Richie Esburn, and I think it had it was in his Hall of Fame induction speech, hmm. or or somebody talking about him. I think it was Richie Esburn. Okay. Another guy like that played in your dad's day. Uh, a foul Luke Appling. Ball, uh, Luke Appling. Yeah, he's the, right. right. He's yep. got that yeah, Luke. <laughs> Luke Applet, you know, I was reading a funny thing about it. You know, old eight, we were talking the other day about nicknames. I mean, his nickname is Old Aches and Pains. You know, not because the ball players called him that, but because Luke Appling was always complaining. You know, this, this, that, and the other thing hurt. And uh, you know, but but he was such a great you know Hall of Fame player. Uh, but you know, and, and I think it wasn't it, David at an old timers game in yep. Washington. He yeah, hit a home run off of. Warren Spahn, I think. Yeah, right down the left field line. Uh, it, it, it was only about 250 feet to the Yeah, they the moved the fence there. in or something, right. Yeah. Well, it was because of the way the, the field was configured. It, was, it wasn't really configured for baseball anymore. Okay. So, right. But, I mean, yeah, he, he poked one out of there, and he, hey. he jogged around the bases like looking like Babe Ruth. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. Speaking of, of for somebody who's the only reason to go out to Warren see Spahn. the White Sox in the thirties and forties. Hmm. Yeah. On in 1962, the Braves came in to play the horrendous Mets in a doubleheader at the Polo Grounds, and I was at that doubleheader. I had to leave after the first game. It was Yum Kipper, and I had to go to some family thing but after the first the first game ends in the bottom of the ninth when Hobie Landreth hits a walk off home run off Warren Spahn <laughs> and the Mets won one of those ones that dropped into the first row in the polo grounds down the right field line I, right field or left field would yeah. Yeah. Well, that, oh, yeah absolutely um, and uh, they said that Sp Spahn tore up the whole uh Locker room after that one. <laughs> oh, I can. You, you know, know like that. You know that in the nineteen fifty four, had a jam of a game going, and to be be beat by Hobie Landreth, and the Mets won the second game in a walk off. I wasn't there. I don't remember. I don't certainly don't remember it firsthand, but I read about uh, the results, and um, that was dramatic because they, they were so bad in those, in that, those early years. Um, in the 1954 World Series between Cleveland and the, uh, the, the New York Giants, Giants, right? The uh, the Indians were uh, uh, had Bob Lemon on the mound, and the Giants sent up a pinch hitter named Dusty Rhodes, a left-handed batter, mm -hmm. and he hit a little pop fly. The second baseman for the Indians, Bobby Ovila, started to go back on it because it was a pop fly, right. but it nailed the scoreboard in right field, an overhanging scoreboard, for a game-winning home run. And 25 years later, Bob Lemon was the manager of the Yankees, and he was still angry about that home run. <laughs> we, had a, 
we had he would come into the press room after the game, and uh, he would sit and just visit with the writers, and it was wonderful. I mean, he had all kinds of stories, but the one what? story that irritated him the most was that Polo Grounds home run by Bobby by uh, Dusty Rhodes. Well, you know what, Hal? I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that. Being a Giant fan, Hal, I'll yeah. You well, well, that, it, but that World it. Series was amazing yeah, because they're, they're the Indians won 111 games, and they go in right. and, uh, you know, they get swept by the Giants because all of a sudden they're, they're playing at the polo grounds. And like Hal said, you know, got Dusty Rhodes hitting a pop-up home run. I think he hit a second one the next day or something. And, 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 there's, hitting the ball yeah. and there's Vic, Vic Wirtz. Vic Wirtz hits a 430-foot shot to center field that's an out because it was caught by Willie Mays. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and, I, uh, I, I have a book uh, by Alvin Dock that he came out with years ago, and he put in there that the, the Giants and the Indians used to barnstorm east because they, were, they both tra- uh, trained in Arizona. Right. They said there were three things that the Giants were not intimidated by them. He said they uh, they were slow and they were lousy on defense. <laughs> yeah. And the Giants, the Giants, because they played them so often during spring training, uh, Doc said that the, you know they were as a team they were not intimidated by the Indians. Right. Well, it was there was amazing. That was amazing World Series because you know playing there. But the fact is that the Indians had set a major league record and and had that great pitching staff. I mean, they had they had Lemon, Feller, Wynn, and and uh, Mike Garcia. I mean, they they was an incredible yeah. staff. Yeah. Well, the and, next and yet, second you know, game. And yet the Giants were able to sweep them in four straight. The second game. Uh, uh, Al Smith leads off for the Indians in the first inning. It's a home run off Johnny Antonelli. That was the only run they got all game. Well, I want and, to ask Willie Mays about the catch against Dick Wirtz. And, you know, he uh, he said it was no big deal. He said, I played wide receiver in high school, and it was just <laughs> like I was a wide receiver going out for a pass. He, he was catching the ball over his shoulder, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And then he... Then he turned to make the throw uh, into the infield, and he s- sort of slipped and tr- as he, as he turned to the talk on his body, you know, got him, caught him. But it was a great oh, thing. He, 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 he always was quoted as he, didn't, he never thought that was the, the best catch he made ever. Right. You know, but it was he, the best throw that that was ever yeah. made because he under got, the circumstances. Well, don't forget, it kept it, a double it's in play the middle of the World it. Series. Yeah, yeah I saw him of course. Make a plays. I saw yeah. him make better plays, but this is the middle of the World Series, you know. Well, of course. So it was course. The, the moment, really. Yeah. And Don Little, the uh, Giants pitcher, was relieved after uh, that catch. And he, Marv Grissom comes in. Little turns to uh, Grissom and says, well, I got my man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 450-foot line drive. Yeah, yeah right. 430-foot uh, uh, out. <laughs> yeah. Nice job, Don. Right. Maybe they you know, th- speaking of the polo grounds, if you recall, when well, we were talking about netting and things, polo grounds at Yankee Stadium were the same way. I mean, if you were in a box, lower box seats, the fence was only about three and a half feet. You know, the the railing uh, on the on the box seats. So everybody in the, in the, from the edge of that netting, which is just around home plate, uh, everybody in that area on both sides were um, in imminent danger of right. getting hit by a fan. And, and, you know, nobody, I guess, because I, I sat there any number of times, and we never thought about it. Yeah. Uh, but what, one of the differences is we were paying attention to the game. Today, everybody's on their cell phone. That's well, all you're, they do. You're, they you're right. You're absolutely hey, David, right. you're right about that. I, I've, I've mentioned that many times. I mean, people used to go to a game to be entertained. That, and that, I mean, the, the entertainment was the ball game. I mean, now they're doing everything else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll you know, see fans, you know, they're, in those they're, days, they're, in yeah, they're talking days. on the cell phones, they're, they're playing on the kiss camera, they're doing all this kind of nonsense, and they're not watching the game. Off, right, right, right. But I was at, to uh, score the game, of course. I was talking, he's, his head is down writing, fans would score the game and um, take Yeah, but you weren't, you, 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 knew, you put the score in and then you, and you looked up. You didn't sit there looking at the, at the cell phone. Right. Um, well, that's that absolutely true. And and I was at I was at the game up in Baltimore. It turned out to be the the last game of of Cal Ripken's streak. The next day he didn't play, but the people in in the row uh, with me 
in and out, in and out, all throughout the game. I don't think they watched a half an inning of the ball game. Right. I don't know what they were doing, but every half inning. I don't understand that. Why? Why did you come to the ballpark? I know. Yeah. The ball game. I know. Right. It's I know. become a corporate perk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they don't really care about the game. It's just part of, uh, you know, a socialization thing, um, whatever. But, you know, when seats are $125 a head, you could understand that, that um, you're not getting the family atmosphere anymore. No, but I'll tell you one other thing. Let me just mention my fanny right down. On yeah, I want to mention one other thing money about that, money worth. Ralph and, and David and, and Alan. I was at a ball game in Yankee Stadium two years ago. My my cousin invited me, and I was happy to go. We had seats right next to the dugout, and and you know it was a wonderful seat. Well, a gentleman who I went with, he probably saw what David's talking about. He probably saw maybe one or two innings. The rest of the time, he was in the gourmet restaurant, mm-hmm. having having like a, you know a, a unbelievable you know lobster tails and steak and all this kind of. I mean, it used to be the old ballpark food was you know hot dog, peanuts, cracker jack, a beer or a soda, whatever. Now right. you know they've got all those gourmet restaurants and, and shopping malls inside you know a, a place like Yankee Stadium. Yeah, well, my cousin calls the new Yankee Stadium a, sh- a shopping mall with a ballpark inside. Yeah, <laughs> basically, that's it, uh, David. It, it's just, you know, it bothers me, again, being a, an old guy and a traditionalist, but, you know, I grew up in ballparks, and, and ballpark food, and you went to the ballpark, and that was it. I mean, today, it's a different situation. I mean, the fans, you know, they're there to be entertained by, you know, all those crazy contests and and fanograms oh, and all I know, that stuff. I, know. I mean, it's just, it's a different world. And, and if you ask them, uh, you know, to tell you a little bit about what's going on, I think half the time they'll have absolutely no idea what the score even is. No, but they will tell you, know, you right, which president won the race in the fourth inning <laughs> at Nats Park, because that's the important thing. They go to watch yeah. these clowns <laughs> run around. Absolutely. That's, that's you know what, what it's I come down to. Where I think you can get that old feeling, if you go to minor league games, we have some minor yes. league baseball here in New York. We have the right. Cyclones and and the Yankees uh, Farm Club and uh, their uh, Class A, the Rookie League, and you don't have that corporate crowd, you know. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So you can no, get you're, you're absolutely right about that, Hal. Minor league baseball is, is wonderful in, in in some of the cities. I know where we live here in Trenton. I mean, the Trenton Thunder, which is a Double A uh, farm club of the Yankees. I mean, they draw you know six seven thousand a game. And you're watching the pure purity of baseball. That's what you're watching. And in the minor leagues, that's what you're getting today. In uh, the major leagues, you know, like we were saying, I mean, it's a, it's a corporate thing now. And this, this, this is about walk-up music. I mean, what do you need music to come up to the yeah, plate for? Right. And the music, <laughs> lasting the music between innings. Oh, yep. God. Drove me nuts. Yeah, or games. They have guys. They have guys in the stand with a, uh, a mini cam, and they'll ask some stupid question to some fan who might win a T-shirt. You know, and, and, and there's no quiet point. Um, you know, if they did that in cricket, I think the, the Brits would revolt. You what know? about the other? Wave. The other thing wave. that bothers me. Uh, I never stood up for me. a wave in all the years I was going to games back then. Never stood up once for the wave. In fact, I, I hated it. Right. Right. And, and you know what you see now on the game of the week or some of these ball games? Now they have a, a reporter in the dugout talking to the manager yeah. or coach yeah. with, with headsets on. I mean, right. this, is, this is insane to me. I don't understand what the appeal is, but I guess the new generation of all the technology, this is what they want to see. But, you know, to me, the, the beauty of the game is the strategy and watching right. and see what happens. Not to be interviewing somebody sitting in the dugout with a headset on. Yeah, in the third inning, you know, oh, wow, what can you tell? <laughs> right. What's going on? It's only the third inning. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> and they have to. I mean, the managers, I guess, are committed by their contracts to do this because right. Major League Baseball, I'm sure, makes it a requirement. Yeah. yeah I wish them basketball or football, you know, because they, 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 they have the coaches at halftime mm-hmm. before the game. Right. Orders, yeah. And everything. I said, I'd like to see some coach going you know, well, coach, you're throwing by 13 points at halftime. What do you have to do 
to win yeah. the game. Outscore him by 14, idiot. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then run off to yeah. be with, his, with the team. Yeah. Because um, the team's already in the locker room. I right. know, yeah. Hey, I'll tell well, you what, what irks me. Let me just put this in because I don't know if you guys ever – they want to speed up the game. Did you ever watch the home plate umpire looking up at the press box for a signal that the commercials are done and you can resume the game now? Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. Well, yeah, well, I, 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 had, I had jet and then, season. And then they take 10 seconds to yeah. save by the intentional walk. They bastardized the game to sure. save money. But I, the I, umpire I, just standing there with his hands on his hips Waiting for the all yeah, the signal, dollar. They had well, that, so, uh, yeah. in, in football because I was I had jet tickets at Chase Day in 1979. That cured me. I haven't been to a pro football game. Oh, it's much worse now. Yeah, and, it's and the, much worse. One now. of the games in the last year, they're playing the you know, you know, Houston Oilers, and the game went into overtime. And it was raining. You know, and the fans are getting rained on and. Every time you see the, when there was a change of possession or whatever, uh, you know, the, 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 some guy in, sitting low in the stands signals for the officials not to not to stop, and then signals after the commercials are done, they signal them to start again. Yeah, and they were they wear special the sleeves. Way, yeah. They're right on the sideline. They wear yeah, special they sleeves that they can be seen. Yeah, in, in college, as I know, I know they do in college. I'm not sure how they do it in the pros, but in college, they, they've got a guy on the sideline. Oh yeah, and, yeah. and he's got a, he's got a jacket on, and he signals to the official on the field when there's a timeout. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, right. you know, all of a sudden, you know, again, it's the tail wagging the dog. Here you have a you know a college team or whatever it is you know they're they're trying to you know have a sustained drive or they're trying to do something and all of a sudden a whistle blows because it's a commercial timeout. Well, you know, the worst, the worst, have part, the yeah, worst part of it is, is that in in the NFL now you don't yeah. even have that respite when they do call timeout because you get to see the same ads on the giant screens <laughs> at either end of the stadium. Uh, I was in Cleveland and I was saw the. the the screens are huge, and instead of just having, okay, a few minutes to just calm down, be quiet, no, they've got all these ads going Yeah, on. you're right, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, noise. George mentioned the magic word the today, and that's college. And we are going to segue with that back to the topic. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we, did get, we did get off topic for a while, that's for sure. A little As bit, usual. I want to... First, introduce the panel. That the voice you just heard was George Case. We have Thank Al you. Blumkin talking about his Shea Stadium experience. Here we have David Hubler, the author and um, Virginiaite, originally from the Bronx, and we have Hal Case, Hal Bach, the Associated Press writer. Now, I want to ask you, Hal. I'm mystified by Miller's case. They had a wiretap. Was this leaked to the press? What what stage of investigation is this in? How um, how, how did it come to well, be that they found out about the wiretap? Well, keep in mind, first of all, that back in November, the FBI uh, released the names of four assistant coaches who were uh, indicted for for uh, wire, after wiretaps for uh, uh, paying off players to go with agents, uh, essentially to sign with agents. And uh, one of those assistant coaches was a guy named Emmanuel Richardson. Emmanuel Richardson is an assistant coach at the University of Arizona. His nickname they is named book. the book. Am I correct? The book. book. Book Richardson had the book thrown at him. Now, I, as I wrote in this column this week, there is nothing that goes on in an athletic program in college that the head coach doesn't know about. So when Joe Paterno shrugged his shoulders over Jerry Sandusky's shenanigans at Penn State and said, well, I have no idea. I don't believe that for a moment. The same thing goes for Rick Pitino at Louisville. 
when they said, oh, uh, these guys had strippers in the dorms. I said, yeah, what? There's people who do that for a living? I never heard of that. Well, no, I think he did hear of it. So to tell me that Sean Miller didn't know about whatever book Richardson was up to is just ludicrous. Now, what they caught Miller on a wiretap, the current wiretap issue, was uh, offering $100,000 to the top recruit uh, in the nation who wound up playing in Arizona, DeAndre Ayu, I think his name is. Payton, A-Y-T-O-N. Yeah. What is it, A-Y-T-O-N? A-Y-T-O-N, yeah, okay. Dayton without the D. <laughs> right, okay. And uh, they caught him on a wiretap offer of hundred grand, or, or discussing a hundred grand. I don't know if he said, I'll, I'll, we will give you $100,000, but whatever he said was enough to implicate him. And all of a sudden, he was on a hot seat, and he disappeared for a game. He was not on the sidelines for their game against Arizona. And Arizona lost, I mean, at, again, against Oregon. And Arizona lost that game. And the next thing you know, what well, pops the devil? Here he is, back on the sideline after the university said, well, our investigation shows that uh, no problem whatsoever with Coach Miller. And, you know, that's, to me, that's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. And what an investigation it must have been for a 24-hour investigation. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And the school's doing the investigating, right? Like, and the kid, the, the kid is supposed to be the number one draft choice in the NBA draft. Uh, you know, he'll drop out of school as soon as the tournament is over and be ready for the NBA draft. Right. So, I mean, that, you know, it's like a sham. I, I, I used to love college basketball. I still have some affection for it. As I sit here watching Syracuse play uh, Wake Forest in the ACC tournament. Um, but, but they're spoiling the game. They really are. Uh, because of what we discussed before, it's all become corporate. It's all become how much money can we raise for the university, how much money can we give the kids to get, get, the, get to the kids to get them to sign with us. I don't believe for a moment that the top rank uh, draft choices are not draft the recruits don't get some some understanding from the university or from the coach that uh, you come to our school and we'll have which for you. And that goes, by the way, for the great John Wooden at UCLA, because they had a guy out there named Sam Gilbert, who was a booster, and he took care of those players, and they won how many championships in a row, eight, nine, ten? So I just believe this has been going on for an awfully long time. Well, it has been, and, Hal, and, you know, over the years, you know, my experience, and, and I, I, you know, I, I echo what you're talking about, but, but coaches, you know, they had people – and you know the nickname we used to call them bagmen. I mean that that's what they were. And uh, you know yeah. they would they would make the you know the transactions and they would uh, you know kids would be driving around in in Mercedes and doing all kinds of stuff because the the uh, car dealership locally was was a was a great booster and fan. I mean this kind of stuff's been going on for years and years and years. Now, you know, it's reached the point where where the FBI is involved, and we've talked about that. And now I think, you know, we're also in this whole thing, what you talked about, Hal, was, you know, somebody's leaking information, and whether ESPN or Yahoo or whoever it is, you know, they're trying to get a scoop, just like in the old days with newspapers. And maybe they were premature, and maybe they'd come up with stuff. But for Sean Miller, and, and I, I applaud him for doing what he did, but I can assure you, when he said, I had nothing to do with it, it's probably true. But he knew what was going on. Believe me, he knew. I, I read in the paper uh, over the weekend that uh, the contract that uh, uh, CBS and uh, Turner uh, have with the uh, NCAA tournament, and Turner doesn't, that's the only time Turner broadcasts college basketball is during the tournament. Is paying the they're paying the NCAA uh, eleven million billion dollars over fourteen years. Yeah, billion, billion. billion. I saw that. Billion. Right, right. Yep. Wow. 
And, and, you know, you're getting into March Madness. I mean, you know, maybe this all is just going to blow over after March Madness, and then they're going to do the real investigative stuff. But, I mean, there's a tremendous, you know, possibility of ratings hits and all this kind of stuff. And, and now, you know, the whole thing with Selection Sunday and all that kind of stuff, how many of these teams are going to be selected? I mean, there, there's cloud over a lot of them. Uh, so what are you going to do now? I happen to look at the at the at the rankings just now, the top 25 or whatever, and you know there there's two teams, uh, Kentucky, which I think normally is up in the top 10. I think they're down toward the bottom of the 25. But Louisville, they're they're not even in there anymore. So you know, uh, Patino and and, and uh, the AD, I mean that whole program now is, is really suffering. But on the other hand, what would happen if, if all of a sudden you get these scandals and, you know, there's Duke and there's, uh, you know, Arizona and, and uh, you know, Villanova and Xavier and all these, you know, all these teams going into the selections. And, and now there's a cloud over the coaches. Well, at this point, you know, the only guy who's really under under the gun, as far as I can see, is Sean Miller. And the University of Arizona is backing him up. But as Hal said, I mean, <laughs> They got a shot to win the national championship and bring millions and millions yeah. of dollars into Arizona. Well, everything is brackets. They made they made the whole thing a national event with the bracketology. Right. And uh, you know, the, 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 every uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry is running. Uh, when I was working, there was there was a guy who used to run uh, uh, run a uh, you know, contest uh, uh, with brackets. I won once in 1989. Michigan beat Seton Hall. But uh, basically, uh, yeah, they're, they're all over offices, all over uh, casinos, everything. You could submit right. submit these brackets, and uh, you're, you're watching games from uh, noon until uh, you know till, till past midnight for, for the uh, West Coast games, and uh, it just drives people up, you know, absolutely nuts. It's a billion dollar industry. Absolutely, it's sure just the brackets right? themselves. The, bra- the whole bracket thing is a fortune. Well, it is, and even even our even our uh, last president, President Obama, I think, yeah. you know, because he was a huge basketball fan, he was doing the brackets himself. And uh, you know, I mean, this has become, you know, all over the country. You're right. I mean, uh, in offices and you know, yeah. any place you go, you're you're going to see guys filling out brackets, and there's a chance to win some money. But on the other hand, you know, you might pick a, a guy, a team to win the national championship, and they get knocked out in the first round. So I mean, that happens too. So so for the winner, of, of it's it's almost uh, you know impossible, but occasionally you will find somebody that's going to hit. Hit them all. Well, the and, one that was run that where I worked, uh, now you know, not only got credit for winning the game, but you got points for the seed. So for number one seed, uh, like Duke, yeah, you know, for the for, you got points for the round and points for the seed. So if right. you got a number one like Duke, that's twenty seven points. But that's the maximum you could get with a number one seed. If you took a a three seed, a th- I'm sorry, a thirteen seed. And they won two games. That was worth more than uh, the than the one seat going the whole way. Mm. Well, so it, it was creative. Yep. Yeah. You know, we talk basketball almost the entire show, and we never use the expression "student athlete." <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, you don't hear that, Bert. There, there aren't. I can that. tell you, there are not many student athletes in the top twenty-five basketball or football programs in the country. Now, now, if and you're talking that many of them who could spell athlete. No, well, if you you're talking the old days, they used to give majors and uh, when they did college football telecasts, right, right, majoring right. in this, right. And I was watching right. Penn State yeah, one day, and uh, they had a running back uh, named Blair Thomas who turned out to be a big bust with the Jets. And they said, well, he's majoring in park and recreation studies. Right. Then they have that as a program. I'm sure oh, they, they do. They do. And, and it's just not Penn State. I mean, a lot of the schools. I know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, know, I, know at Rutgers, I know at Rutgers, this, Rutgers this a couple of years ago, a, a kid got yeah. kicked off the team because uh, uh, Kyle Flood, the football coach, wanted the, the dance instructor to, to yeah. change the guy's uh, grade in, in, in dance. You know, I mean, this is just absurd, absurd. 
So student athletes, you know, if you're a Division two, II, Division three, you know, where, where you are a true student athlete, or, or like you're talking about how and and all we we've mentioned about NYU. I mean, those kids, you know, they're going to school and they're getting an education. And uh, the Ivy League, you know, there, there's some abuses, I'm sure. But on the other hand, you do have guys like Bill Bradley, uh, you know, who, who was an Ivy Leaguer, one of the greatest of all college players, went on a great, you know, pro career, went, you know, became a Rhodes Scholar, became a U.S. Senator. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of those guys out there, and it's just not the Ivy League. But there are still some student athletes. But when it comes to the George, major colleges, I have to say they're very few. I was there in 61, in 60, 61, and Bradley was at Princeton at six, in 65. So, you know, I missed him by a couple of years, but I remember, you know, watching him play. He was he was marvelous, marvelous player. Well, and that's I think not I mentioned what I was that, asking you. I was asking you, what was it like as a student athlete back then? Well, back then, I can tell you, Ralph, <laughs> We didn't have the benefit of tutors and and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we had to study, and and if we didn't if we didn't make our grades, yeah, if we didn't make our grades, we were put on uh, on academic probation. I mean, that that's that's Rutgers, and I'm sure a lot of the schools were the same way. But it's a a different world today. Uh, you know, Rutgers. When I was there, we were playing. You know, Army, Navy, Princeton, Penn, Columbia, Harvard, all that kind of stuff. You know, today, you know, Rutgers is is playing Big Ten. And and their payout beginning next year, because they joined the Big Ten, their payout will be forty million dollars from the Big Ten. Mm. Oh, wow! So and I bet when um, you played Georgia, I bet you wrote your own term papers too. Yeah, I, matter of fact, I did, and I used to laugh. My my <laughs> wife would call up and they'd say, "Well, you know, she wanted to talk to me." I said, "Well, he's in the library." Because that's what we had to do. We had to go to the library to to, to write books and, yeah. and take out books so we could write our term papers. Because you were going to college. Right. Well, there's also a big move to get rid of the one and done in the college basketball and establish the NBA to establish some sort of minor league. Yeah. There's a big push on that. So the they get rid of the one and done. talking about that. Which I think is was unconstitutional in the first place. But then, yeah, but uh, who, uh, who knows? Well, they have that development league. You know, yeah, but the, yeah, the development league. They said the maximum pay is twenty six thousand yeah. to a player. Now you can't come out of high school like Daryl Dawkins did. Not, not, that, 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 the one done probably is going to go away after next year. Maybe even after this year. It wasn't just Daryl Dawkins. Uh, wasn't it? Uh, what's his name? Uh, LeBron James. Kobe LeBron Bryant. James. Yeah, Kobe right. Bryant. There have been quite a few that have gone, you know, they haven't even gone the college route. They just, you know, signed right out of high school. And yeah, right. Become a long player. Yeah. Yeah. And for the college, you know, a lot of the college coaches, what, what Alan's talking about, the one and done, I mean, you know, it used to be you'd have a kid, you know, he, he, when I was there, in college playing, we couldn't play our freshman year, so right. you had three varsity years. Yeah, you know, but, but coaches would recruit that way, and you'd have a kid on your team for you know, say, three years. You know, today the way it's turned out, I mean, some of these superstars with a one and done, I mean, they play one year, they're playing their freshman year, all of a sudden they declare and they're gone. Yeah, and so, you know, and then the coaches say, "Oh yeah, I I think he did the right thing." I mean. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, if he was the fifteenth guy on the roster, and he decided to, and the coach says, "Yeah, yeah," so he did the right thing because you yeah. get it, you remove him from the team. But to take his star and say, "Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he played one year and he's he's ready for right. the NBA," so we'll yeah, just he, let him. Yeah. He, he's ready, and he was absolutely a student athlete. I can. Yeah, imagine. right. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to go back to school. Um, you know, when his NBA career is over. Right. And the fan misses. The teamwork that only playing together for two, three, maybe four years in, play, in the old days can produce. You can't just bring guys in for one year and expect it to be anything but look at me for that guy so he can, he can develop a reel and um, a, high, a highlight reel and yeah. basketball. How does teamwork come into that? How does basketball, five guys playing together, remember the weave, you know, things like that, that 
you never see anymore. It's run and shoot and stop and get the three pointer going and you know, well, especially for these guys who are intent on spending just one year in college, all they want to do is show off. You know, get right. their name out there because that's that's what they want. That's well, they do, they, and you're yeah. talking about you know what you're saying, Ralph and, and David. You're saying like a three point shooter. I mean, you know, some of these kids they'll, they'll come up and they'll start heaving from 35 feet or whatever mm-hmm. because you know they know that their stock is going to rise if if an NBA team is looking for a three point shooter. All of a sudden, they might have this kid, and they that's can right. offer him. Oh, you can offer him ten billion dollars to sign. So I mean that that's the way it's become. And, and you're right. I mean the the kids are not out there playing. You know. A, team game the way it used to be a lot of them are really playing for themselves to 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 give them a highlight reel that's going to bring them a lot of money in the in the nba we do have a team down there as david virginia which i've seen play quite a few times this year and they they play the they play the game for the most part, the way it's supposed to be played. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've read that, Alan. Uh, that, that guy has done a really good job in Virginia. I think is ranked number one right now. Yeah. And and the articles that I've read about him, that that he really has these kids believing and and playing a team game. And and from what I've read, there are really no, you know, first round superstars on that team. You know, they, they've no. blended together. And they're yeah. playing the, the way the coach wants them to play, good defense and, and working as a team on offense. To, you know, and they're, they're what are they, 20, 26 and 2 or 28 yeah, and 2 or something like that. They played right? them a couple of weeks ago and got seven points in the first half. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's amazing. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that only proves that if the coaches and if the administration want to do it the, the right way, they can. Yeah. Right. Because, well... Um, I, I just want to say the guy that the chancellors that covered up Paterno and his as house of shenanigans, they ended up getting fired in the long run. Yeah, they did. Yep. So maybe these uh, muckety mucks at Arizona who investigated uh, one of their own and found nothing wrong at all, maybe the la- it'll work itself up. Those guys will be indicted too, because um, if they knew anything and they let this guy go on, that'll come out eventually. So, um, well, I think it will, Ralph. And you know, when that, that whole thing, that whole thing with Sandusky and, and Paterno and Penn State, I mean, th- that might have been you know kept kept under the you know carpet or under the rug or whatever until that one assistant coach, that that young kid. I mean, he came out and said, yeah, he he. He happened to see what was going on, so he's the one who who really started. I mean, he originally blew the whistle, and then from then on, you know, it just snowballed. And and you know, Paterno loses his job, the president of the university loses his job, the AD, whatever it is, because you know. And I think that's going to happen with some of these uh, college basketball scandals that you know I've said. There's a movie before. coming out called Paterno without you know. Yeah. Well. You know, I mean, it's a it's a world, it's a it's a sick world, and and a lot of this stuff goes on. And and I'm only telling you from my experience. I mean, I saw it, and when I saw it, it was a lot less than it is now. Now it's just it's, it's some of it's it's really horrible, and the amount of money that's being spent, and and what happened at Louisville. I mean, I hope it it's not happening elsewhere where you're actually putting money into a family to influence a kid to go to a certain school because of the shoe that they wear. And guys, I'm losing power on my phone. Okay. okay. Um, Don't you have a real phone, like one that's got a wire <laughs> yeah, in no, the wall? Is, <laughs> well, it's cheap, but I have them in a few rooms here. Hey, we're all dealing with the Internet and Comcast, yeah. and the, it's a crazy, crazy. It, it gives us the privilege to be able to do do this, but sometimes it drives you nuts. Um, so we excuse your phone, Al. Yeah, I've got to hang this up. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. We'll see you yeah. next week. Yeah, everybody next week. Next week. Yep. We're about, time we back are now. about to wrap it up. Is there anything that any of you have left unsaid and want to correct that right now? Start with the man, Hal Bach. Anything you want to close with? Uh, couldn't get to your uh, break yet until 15 minutes later. I don't know what was going on with the phones, but... Uh, I, I started dialing in before 8 o'clock, and it took me 15 minutes to connect, so I don't know why. 
Well, um, you seem I'm here. breaking up a little now. I don't know if the others are listening I'll to you. I hear it. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah, I've heard that. So, maybe it's just a bad connect in New Yorkville today. How about that? <laughs> Could happen. Uh, we'll, right. we'll blame it. We'll blame it on the weather. <laughs> hey, blame it on the bossa nova for crying out loud. <laughs> Nobody does that there anymore. You go. They're always blaming other things. And that's, <laughs> yeah, I've got to go. Good. This is beeping too much. Okay. Okay. Thanks, I'll, everyone. See you guys. Have you all have to go. We'll this has been terrific. Comfortably zoned radio network. Uh, thanks for telling us the score, Hal. You got it, Hal. <laughs> all right. We'll be back next week. Same time, same bat channel, as Al would have said, but his phone went out. Thank the you bat phone. The bat phone went out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll, we'll see you, everybody. Bye. Okay. Yep. Take All care. Right. Nice. Case Jr., Bye-bye. Al Blumkin, ha- um, Hal Bach, and myself, Ralph Tycho, the weak link of the Comfortably Zoned radio network. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to hey. you real soon. Thank you. Adios, we'll we'll see you all later. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Be well.